To be playing Sega Genesis with bros Now I'm gaming with some folks on the other side of the globe Used to go through a label if you trying to blow Now people got more I made the sacrifice to watch Impact Sacrifice So, I gotta talk about it March 24th, 2023 Uh, the show was actually better than the last Impact show that I watched and I'm actually quite interested in in where it's going in the future. Um, the stories are still kind of gobby, um, but uh, there is some legitimate stuff going on. So both Josh Alexander and Mickey James suffered injuries, and they were both announced within 12 hours of each other. Josh Alexander is just flat out done, while Mickey James is kind of on a wait and see kind of situation. Um, let's talk about this before we get into the show. Uh, Josh Alexander tore his triceps. He had to undergo a surgery. He will be out for the foreseeable future. He had to cough up the Impact World title. The number one contender, I believe, was Steve Macklin, but he was going to wrestle Kushida at this show, which was a big sacrifice. Um, likely, he would have beaten Kushida and uh, would have gone on to face Steve Macklin at Rebellion. Um, now, because he's injured, Kushida will be face Steve Macklin for the title at Rebellion, which is boring. Not because I don't like Kushida or Steve Macklin, but once somebody hands you an opportunity to do something fun, like a tournament, like trying to build new contenders, like trying to do something fresh, you know, once you get that opportunity to blow it by just, you know, making the, the quick decision that, well, we're probably going to give the belt to Macklin, so... Let's just give the belt to Macklin. It's like, okay. You know, it's kind of it's kind of weak. You know, it doesn't make me want to watch Impact week to week. You know? Um, and it's it's un it's not... That's what I mean by... I think the last time I, I called this show Dreadfully Canadian. Because that's kind of how it is, you know? It's like, sure, you could... Just give the title to the guy you're probably going to give it to anyway and, you know, stick with your plan. Or you could still give the title to the guy you wanted to give it to, but make him work a little harder for it. You know, a tournament or uh, something else, you know. But Josh Alexander, I have complained about him endlessly as Impact World Champion. He is a dreadfully boring champion, um, even though he was having good matches. He was just a boring performer, and he was generally just not that interesting. Um, here's hopefully that he comes back far more interesting and refreshed, and hopefully Impact has done something interesting by the time he comes back. Hopefully they're in a different place when he comes back, and uh, you know I know that his surgery was successful and he'll be on the mend pretty soon, but here's just hope that things will work out for uh, impact so that Josh Alexander can return and, you know, be able to add something to the promotion. Cause I don't, I certainly don't feel like he adds anything at this point, you know, and that's just, that's just me. So Mickey James, she had a broken rib and she broke her rib at a, in a match. She was supposed to face Jordan grace at sacrifice. But Jordan Grace got hosed far more than Steve Macklin did. So, uh, Mickey, because Mickey James is not going to require any surgery or anything like that, she's just not medically cleared to compete. So they're hoping that she can be medically cleared to compete by rebellion. So, despite the fact that Jordan Grace, who was the number one contender and was using her rematch clause to get the title shot, she's going to have to wrestle either the winner of whatever multiverse show thing that they're doing, they're doing that. I think it's a co-branded show in New Japan that Impact is doing. She's going to have to wrestle the winner of that match. It's a fatal four-way match which features, I think, Masha Slamovich, uh, Miyu Yamashita, and two other young ladies whose names escape me right now. But it's a fatal four-way match. And these two and these four women, the winner of that match, will wrestle Jordan Grace at Rebellion. Um, if Mickey James can wrestle, then the winner of the multiverse match 
and Jordan Grace will both get title shots. So it will be a triple threat match. So Jordan Grace is either going to wrestle a one-on-one match against <laughs> somebody from a multiverse fatal four-way, or she's going to get screwed out of her title shot by having to wrestle a triple threat match. Again, this is another uh, chance for Impact where they were handed an opportunity to do something big. And instead, they did something kind of boring. And to me, I, I feel like you really missed a lot uh, by not taking advantage of these people being injured. Whenever somebody is injured and they can't compete, it, it, it gives you an opportunity to shake up storylines. You know, it gives you an opportunity to shake up interest in your program. Because now, pe- I, I would have taken the title from Mickey James. I'm not even going to hold you up. I just said... Storyline for storyline purposes, Jordan Grace would have been in the ring saying, "Hey, she's injured. It's a forfeit. I'm the champion." At which case, maybe you do hand her the title, and then you you do the old. I think uh, uh, WWF did it with uh, John Cena. He handed over the WWE title. He gave it to Randy Orton, and then Orton had to defend it against Triple H. He lost it. Triple H defended it against Umaga, and then defended it against Randy Orton the same night and lost it back. I'm not saying do that. That's stupid. What I'm saying is Jordan Grace should have taken the title via forfeit and turned heel. And then a baby face should have come out there and challenged her. And then maybe another heel should have come out there and, and said, no, no, no. I should be, you know, the top girl or whatever. And then say Jordan Grace, say, I will wrestle the winner at Rebellion. And then you do that match. And then Jordan Grace acts like she won the title, even though she won the belt by forfeit. And then you have Mickey James constantly challenging her, saying that when I come back, I'm going to win the title back from you, yada, yada, yada. That would have been much more interesting than, hey, watch this show to see this match that you probably wouldn't have cared about otherwise in order to get to Rebellion. It's like, uh, uh. but some of these people don't even work in Impact. You know, like that's the thing about the Kushida situation. It's like, we, we pretty much know that Kushida's not going to win the title. He doesn't work in Impact. So the the idea that he's going to win the title, non-existent, not in my mind at all. Macklin's going to be the champion, which, you know, depending on how you feel about that. But you could have shaken things up. You should have could have told a story, you know. Could have created a Cinderella, a March Madness type of situation. And I get it. They probably don't have a lot of time between now and Rebellion. I get that. But you, they should have done something else. You know, I know that Impact likes to tape. And that's going to be the big problem. That, you know, they're going to, they had already put together their taping schedule and what they were going to do on the tape shows. And that really kind of fucks up the fun of it. But you certainly could have done something far more interesting than what they did. And uh, I feel like it's a huge missed opportunity to do something fun with your product when your champion is injured or when your champion can't defend. It gives you opportunities to do something fun. Um, I also forgot to talk about uh, Scott Demore's promotion. Uh, this is this was a mistake as far as I'm concerned. I know that nobody's been more loyal to Impact than Scott Demore, but for Christ's sake, giving this guy more power, like he is such a boring booker. And in a business that's all about getting attention, you got this super conservative booking that's not meant to to rustle any feathers and not meant to make anybody, you know, upset or not really geared towards get, getting emotional reactions. It's it's hard for me to take, you know, this show seriously with Scott Demore running it. I'm sorry. But um Scott Demore was uh, named, I think, Impact President, uh, President of Impact Wrestling. This was back in early March, March 13th. So approximately about 10, two weeks ago, almost, he became uh, the president. So he was executive vice president, so he got like a, a, a miniature bump. But uh, kudos for Scott Demore if you're the kind of person who likes him. I, I, I don't. I, again, I think this show was far too conservative. It's too, far too straightforward. I know it's sometimes people just want straight up wrestling show, but Impact just comes across as a stopgap. Nobody stays here for a long time, therefore there's no desire to build any around anybody, build up anybody, or anything like that. 
And it's a, it's a true shame that um, we're, we're stuck with impact being this way when there's so many options and opportunities out there. Um, it's just sad, especially when you know that other taped programs like MLW can actually get uh, people's attention and they have good matches and they have characters that are signed somewhat long term. You know, not as long as uh, with impact, but sometimes, you know, people are there for a while. And their shows are infinitely more energetic and more noteworthy. You know, just because Court Bauer is a dipshit doesn't mean that he ha- he runs a bad wrestling show. I mean, I'm not a big fan of all the Microman stuff. We could I could do it all, all the midget wrestling. I don't know why that's happening, but other than that, uh, they have they still have you know pretty good feuds, pretty good matches, pretty good angles and stuff like that. Impact dry, just dry un flavorless you know just they need to put some seasoning on this shit so uh, sp- <laughs> let's get into it so i spent 10 minutes on this stuff bupender gujar versus eddie edwards this is the pre-show eddie edwards wins nobody cares i don't i don't understand why bupender gujar is on the roster what is his purpose they just feel like they have to have an indian wrestler is it like every wrestling company has to have at least one indian wrestler like how about you find somebody who's actually good and somebody who's charismatic in Indian? And it's not just pick up random Indian guy. For starters, I can tell you're not serious about him because you let his name be Bupinder. <laughs> that would have been the first thing I'd have got rid of. Like Bupinder? We're not yelling Bupinder over the goddamn microphone in, in, a, in an auditorium. That's not going to happen. We're not going to do Bupinder. No. Mm-mm. Pass. Go come up with a name. I don't know. I don't care if this is your granddad's name. I don't care if it's your daddy's name. I don't care what that name is. We're not yelling Boo Pender into the microphone. Not while I'm cutting the checks. So I already know you're not you're not serious about your business because you got a guy named Boo Pender on your roster. Um, Eddie Edwards still looks like a fucking goof because he's got green hair. He's fat. So, I mean, it is what it is on Eddie Edwards. He sucks. Uh, Kylan King, who is the new uh, free agent signing to Impact, She's quite good. She really impressed in the NWA. Uh, Kylan King, uh, I think I first saw her in AEW. She was an AEW dark uh, regular. She really upped her stock by working in NWA for a while. And now she's the knockouts, one of half of the knockouts tag team champions. She was the one who sent Taya Valkyrie bye bye by pinning her in a tag team championship match, I think a week or two ago. So Kylan King is very solid. She had a hell of a. Uh, match with Camille in NX, in, uh, I'm about to say NXT, NWA, and uh, she's good. So of course she did a job for Rosemary on the pre-show of this. Uh, <laughs> Jessica uh, attacked uh, Taylor Wilde, who was uh, doing um, a Wiccan witch gimmick, which includes tarot cards and a bunch of other stuff. And she got attacked by Jessica, and that distracted Kylan King, and Rosemary ended up winning the match. Uh, this sucks. Kylan King shouldn't have, been, shouldn't have lost. I'm not even going to hold you up. For me, you know, Impact has a really deep women's division. Like, they really do have some decent women on this roster. But it goes back to what I was saying about Mickey James. They do boring shit with them. You know? Like, Kylan King is basically still new on the roster. Why would you have a, a old also ran like Rosemary beat her? Like, I wouldn't have done that. You would have could have let Kylan King run for a little while. But and this is, it was the same thing with Masha Slamovich. It was the same thing with Killer Kelly. They bring these women in. They look good for a little while. And then they just melt in with everybody else. They don't stand out anymore. Nothing matters. They just fit right in for a little while. Then they're on the way out. Um, I saw people that was very kind of upset about Kylan King and Taylor Wilde also doing sort of the the dark witch gimmick. And they say that so many people who are doing that, especially, you know, Alba fire and, um, Oh shit. Sorry. Uh, Alba fire and Isla Dawn who are doing it in NXT. And everybody's like, well, why are there so many witch gimmicks? And it's like, well, women are interested in magic. I I don't want to go too deeply into that, but women are very interested, very into the spiritual. And, um, 
Isla Dawn, as far as we know, as far as I know, rather, she's like a real Wiccan, a real pagan, you know. So, and she's been doing this for quite a while. I'm not saying, you know, that, you know, uh, Tyler Wilde is ripping her off. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, because people could be interested in the same thing. I know, uh, I know people think that uh, people's ideas are totally and completely unique. It's like, no, people have similar interests. You know, there's tons of women who are into tarot, tarot cards and palm reading and they watched Charmed. And then Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and they're like, oh, we're into this. It's like when, you know, wrestling in the 80s, every guy watched Mad Max, and all of a sudden they were wearing hockey masks and face paint, and, you know, they were named Sid Vicious or Lord Humongous or whatever, because they all watched the same damn movies. Everybody watched like Robocop and Terminator or whatever, so you start seeing people rip off what everybody was watching, and then some guy be like, oh, you ripped me off. He's like, no, we watched the same shit. So, you know, like, we all come from the same place. So, um, I get it that characters and people can have the similar ideas. Um, but it's, it is a copycat business, too, you know. That's what I said on Twitter when people was talking about it. I'm like, look, man, this is a copycat business. People see that something worked, and they're like, look, I'm just going to run with that. I don't care. It doesn't matter. As long as it's not a complete and total ripoff, like, you know, Renegade with, with the Ultimate Warrior, you usually can escape. Uh, <laughs> you're just doing a similar gimmick. But Kylan King losing, that sucked. All right, so the main card, let's get started. Jonathan Gresham versus Speedball Mike Bailey. Still not a fan of Mike Bailey. Uh, this match told a simple story. It was all about respect between these two guys. Jonathan Gresham uh, was defeated the first time. Um, and he basically pushed for this rematch and he lost again. Uh, this time Mike Bailey, uh, wins by submission rather than sort of a quick roll up. Uh, Jonathan Gresham had been working the knee the whole entire match, but was being a little dirty. He wasn't releasing moves when Mike Bailey got to the, to the rep, to the ropes. He was, you know, pulling hair, you know, being a, being a little dirty and it frustrated Mike Bailey and, uh, not a big fan again. <laughs> Totally not a big fan of Mike Bailey. He's a boring guy. Just Canadian. Canadian as fuck. Um, but Mike Bailey wins. So I'm guessing they're going somewhere with this. Uh, you would hope so. All right. Second match. Even worse than... Well, the first match is at least a good work rate match. The second match was an embarrassment. Brian Myers versus Joe Hendry. Look, I don't have no problem with Joe Hendry. I have no beef with Joe Hendry. He's entertaining. Brian Myers, though, fucking sucks and the fact that he is on all of these shows all the time makes me either it makes me want to dribble the eyes out of my head i can't believe this fucking guy is still on this roster for christ's sake i guess i guess he got nowhere else to go but for fuck's sake why do you keep pushing him make this dude a backstage agent or something we need to completely redo the mid card here in impact um Moose offered to actually help Brian Myers win the title because Joe Hendry had humili humiliated him. Uh, but Santino Morella stepped in and banned Moose from ringside, so Joe Hendry ended up winning the match. Yay. Oh, boy. Third match on the show. Uh, Giselle Shaw was defeated by Deanna Perrazzo. This is a rematch from the, uh, from the match uh, th these two had, I think, a week or two ago where Giselle Shaw defeated Deanna Perrazzo. Uh, this match, this feud is based off of Giselle Shaw running, uh, Chelsea Green out of impact and, uh, bragging about it. So Deanna Peraza was pretty upset about this. Uh, Deanna Peraza wins with the Venus de Milo. Um, I don't, I didn't really pay attention to this, to be quite honest. Um, I like Deanna Peraza, but we don't, we don't, we're dealing with something. We're dealing with powers beyond my control when it comes to Giselle Shaw. In any event, Savannah Evans has been running around with Giselle Shaw for a couple of weeks now as one of her underlings. And after the match, Savannah Evans attacked Diana Perrazzo from behind. This led to Tasha Steeles making her big return. I wonder where she went. I guess she got injured. So she tried to talk sense into Savannah Evans. Savannah Evans actually listened. And then Tasha Steeles attacked Savannah Evans from behind, which I was like, huh? She tried to, you know, get Savannah to like, hey, girl, I'm back, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then she attacked her from behind. 
I was like, that's not exactly what a baby face would do. But, you know, the crowd was into it because she was helping Deanna Perazzo. So then, of course, Tasha Steele starts to, you know, fight everybody off and, you know, ended up helping uh, Deanna. Um, now, Tasha Steele hasn't been a baby face in a while. At least I don't remember her being a baby face in the last two years. I think she's been a heel for at least two years straight. So uh, this ought to be, this at least is a fresh return for her. Um, there's a lot of one thing in this feud. Um, I, I don't want to say what it is, but there's a lot of one thing. If I talk about Giselle Shaw, Tasha Steeles, and that Jay Vidal, there's a lot of something in this, in this feud. Um, if you know, if you know, you know, but there's a lot of something in this feud. Moving on. Kenny King was defeated by PCO. Uh, I can't believe PCO is winning matches. He's 60. Also can't believe he's winning. He's taking these insane bumps. He took a bump off the top rope onto the ring apron. He got slammed on the floor. Like this dude is 60. What, what is he taking that he can still do? This guy was wrestling in 1992. And he's still here, still taking bumps on the floor. It's it's a miracle. It literally is a miracle. PCO is he must not be human. The gimmick might be real. <laughs> he, might, he might really not be human. Like he's an old man. And he takes more bumps than than fucking Brock Lesnar at this point. PCO legit takes crazier bumps than like Brock Lesnar or Undertaker or Roman Reigns or anybody. Like the only people who take bumps like PCO are like young guys in AEW, like Sammy Guevara and shit. Except PCO can't do like a, you know, 450 whippity do off the top rope. You know, I'm infinitely impressed at his ability to take bumps. I just don't understand why he does it. I don't get it. Um, I like Kenny King. Him losing here was that sucked. But it was all about uh, PCO's feud with uh, Eddie Edwards, which is um, continuing to go on. And Kenny King was trying to be a good soldier for Eddie Edwards. It's still, this is the remnants of that goofy honor no more storyline that everybody gave up on very quickly. Uh, which is, to me, uh, proved that Scott Demore did not know what he was doing. When he botched that storyline, I knew he wasn't you know, the man for the job. Let's put it like that. Uh, they had a vignette for a young lady named Jody Threat, who I've never seen before in my life, so I can't be happy or upset about it. Um, it is what it is. Uh, the fifth match on the show was Lince Dorado versus Trey Miguel for the X Division title. This was actually a very good match. Um, Lince Dorado has been, you know, he's been popping in and out. He's been working on ML. He, I think he was the, they don't call it the Cruiserweight champion, the Middleweight champion on um, MLW recently. I think he still is, actually. Um, talented guy. Uh, this wasn't the uh, spectacular high-flying X Division match that you usually would think. It was a very solid wrestling match with you know some guys popping out some higher-flying moves later on. Trey McGill is definitely coming into his own as a heel. Um, changed his style up in terms of working heel. And I generally like this match. This is the first match on the show. Well, the second match after um, Mike Bailey and Jonathan Gresham. But I don't really like Mike Bailey, so fuck him. <clears throat> Let's move on. <laughs> but that was the first match I like, genuinely sat down and was like, I enjoyed this. I think this is pretty good. Uh, TMDK, who is Shane Haste, who was Slapjack in WWE. Slapjack is in this match. And Bad Dude Tito. Let me tell you about Bad Dude Tito. Because I had seen Bad Dude Tito in like uh, Championship Wrestling from Hollywood, I believe. I think that's the first time I saw him. And I think I also saw him in Bloodsport. Now he's working in New Japan. He's part of the Mighty Don't Kneel. Uh, this is the same faction that Bronson Reed was in when he beat Okada. He beat Okada, then jumped ship to WWE. But back to Bad Dude Tito. He is such a 1980s WWE guy. I... I like him. All right. They cut a little promo before their match. And uh, he called himself Teets. That Teets loves the gold. And then he starts talking about how much he enjoys beating up on the Bullet Club. And then he was told that it's not the real Bullet Club. It's like the Bullet Club Junior Division. It's like the little guys in the Bullet Club. He's like, that's even easier. 
And then <laughs> I I legitimately he was over with me before the bell rang. That's how and, and not just because I had seen because I hadn't seen him in a while. I don't really I skipped through all the six man tags, tag team matches and stuff on New Japan. So I hadn't really like sat down and got jiggy with his New Japan run. So I hadn't seen him in a while. So he was legitimately very good in this match. He's a big guy, charismatic. He did like a bunch of power moves in this match. But of course, because he's the big guy who's charismatic and has, you know, um, some speed, some strength. Of course, he's going to be the guy that's going to do the job for the for the small Chris. What was it, Chris Bay or <laughs> Ace Austin, whichever one pinned him. It, this was a fun match too. TMDK versus the Bullet Club Impact World Tag Team Titles. This match was actually fun. Wrong guy got pinned, but this was fun. Bad dude Tito should, if he's under the age of thirty or just just slightly over the age of thirty, he probably should go to NXT. I think he would definitely make some money in WWE. He's good, and I'm not saying he's not going to make shit in New Japan. I'm just just saying if you are stuck in the tag team division in New Japan right now. And he looks a lot like Jeff Cobb. He has a similar look to Jeff Cobb. I don't think he is Polynesian like Jeff Cobb, but he just kind of looks a little bit like him. Um, I, I'm not. It's going to take forever to to climb the ladder. But I think Bad Dude Tito got something. Slapjack, he has a little something too. I always thought he was cool when he was in NXT. Then the Slapjack thing happened, and I was like, oof, hey, you can't recover from that. So your best bet is to basically. Um, <laughs> leave the country <laughs> once you once you've been slapjack and you were slapjack for like I don't know six months or whatever. You are better off leaving the country and not coming back. But this match was actually good, so I'm like, oh, you know what? Uh, Impact is doing good. Uh, they had two matches straight that caught my attention, where I liked the guys that were in it, where I had fun watching it. I was like, okay, this show's actually it's turning around, baby. It's turning around. And then Tommy Dreamer versus Bully Ray. Busted open match, which is first blood. They had the nerve to tell me on commentary that these two had their very first match on ECW Hardcore TV in 1998. I, I, that's, uh, uh, that's, why, why are they, I, oh God. This was a mess. This was, of course, ECW bullshit match. Cheese graters, uh, you know, thumbtacks, dumbtacks, as I call them. A bunch of other horse shit. Now, the psychology of the match was, was actually pretty interesting. Uh, Tommy Dreamer made Bully Ray bleed, but the referee wasn't around to see it. Bully Ray Stooges came out there to beat up Tommy Dreamer. Meanwhile, Bully Ray used a towel to clean the blood off of his face and continued the match. Um, and each time that Bully Ray was bleeding, the referee either was down and out or the referee couldn't see him. Uh, they had run Tommy Dreamer's face into the um, into the dumb tax. And ultimately, they ended up busting Tommy Dreamer open. And Tommy Dreamer bled and lost the match. Uh, Bully Ray had got into it with former uh, Detroit Red Wing Darren McCarty outside the ring. And he's a hockey guy. And... They did the old Lawrence Taylor Bam Bam Bigelow thing where, you know, I think he shoved him or called him out while he was in the ring or whatever uh, during the match. And then after the match, they're beating the shit out of Tommy Dreamer and Darren McCarty jumped the barricade to try to help him. Bully Ray told security to let him go. Darren McCarty got in the ring, got beat up and put through a table. And then this led for the the cavalry to arrive. So now after J Darren McCarty, you know, NHL guy, tough guy, he's old now though, but tough guy, comes in there and gets beat up. Now here comes Scott Demore, because Scott Demore is returning because, you know, the reason why we got, we were stuck with Santino is because Scott Demore was out. But now Scott Demore is back. And I'm like, huh, okay. But Scott Demore didn't come alone. He, he brought all the mid card with him. Rhino, Heath, Mike Bailey, a bunch of other guys. And they chased Bully Ray and his boys out of the ring. 
And then he gave one of Bully Ray's stooges a Canadian destroyer, which is probably the, if you are, were even in the least bit interested in this show, you probably saw the, the clip of that. So there that goes. Scott DeMora is now feuding with Bully Ray. Their feud is continuing. Oh, Jesus Christ. The main event, six man tag time machine. That will be Kushida plus the Motor City Machine Guns versus Steve Macklin, who is filling in for Josh Alexander and Josh Alexander's original partners, Rich Swan and Frankie Kazarian. Uh, the, the time machine wins when Kushida actually taps out uh, Chris Sabin. I'm sorry. He didn't tap out Chris Sabin. He couldn't. They were on the same team. He tapped out, I believe, Kazarian. So um, it is uh, it was nothing. I didn't care about the last two matches. I felt really bad that I didn't care, but I didn't care. And they didn't do anything in these matches to make me care. And the storyline going into the match is that Steve Macklin just wants to scout Kushida for their big match at Rebellion. And I was just kind of like, I don't, it's a six man tag main event. This would have been fine if they'd have put it in the middle of the show. And I don't know what you could have had as the closer then. But none of these guys are like main event acts to me. Like Kushida's not a main event guy. Motor City Machine Guns, they are as a tag team main event. But none of these guys just felt main event to me. So this match didn't feel main event. But at least this show had two matches that I really do suggest people go and watch. Lince Dorado and Trey Miguel, quite good. TMDK versus the Bullet Club, also quite good. Jonathan Gresham and Mike Bailey is also good. If you like those guys, you might enjoy that. I liked it. I didn't hate it. I just don't like Mike Bailey. I don't, I just, he's boring to me. Like those kicks that look like they couldn't, you know, tear a hole in a loaf of a slice of bread. Like you just couldn't, you couldn't break wet bread with those kicks. They're so terrible. Especially when he does them like the, in the machine gun style, we just kick, 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 like, like, like uh, Naomi does. It's like, <laughs> you have to actually put some force behind kicks. You really do. In order for a kick to work, you have to put some force behind them. Those kicks, those machine gun kicks or whatever, they literally do nothing. But other than that, the show was pretty pedestrian. Um, if you're an Impact fan, you probably enjoyed this show. For me, I just enjoyed three of the six matches, six, six or seven matches that they put out there. They dropped the ball on making things interesting. When it comes to Josh Alexander and Mickey James both being injured at the same time, they could have done something very interesting there. That's actually what propelled me to watch the show is like, I'm like wondering what's going to happen. Like I've avoided spoilers and everything because I want to know what's going to happen with the titles. And then I watch the show and it's basically that they've already decided. It's not, it's not chaotic at all. It's like, oh yeah, we slotted this person here and this person here. So we're all set. I'm just kind of like, oh, ugh. and it's all the same people. And it's not even anything new or anything different or anything fresh. It's the same motherfuckers I've been looking at all this time. You know, the people who weren't ready two weeks ago are now all of a sudden still here. I'm like, oh, boy. Okay, I guess. But, again, it is what it is. Let me know what you guys think. Like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out. Mongo Slate. Best house ever, you daddy. <laughs>